Hello, my name is Mary Claire Kennedy. I'm here today on behalf of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy and we're delighted to have been asked to contribute to the Charger Meeting of 2022. What you're about to see today is a series of presentations all centred around the key theme of supporting and facilitating professional development for pharmacists during the COVID-19 pandemic. So how this session will run is we have a series of pre-recorded clips, three separate clips, and one will flow into each other. So you can expect a, a little break between each clip. Um, they, set, they focus around some initiatives that the Irish Institute of Pharmacy have taken to respond to the learning needs and development needs of pharmacists during, during COVID. Some of our speakers who contribute today are specialists on the subject matter. And if you have any questions, particularly about the content relating to Paxlovid, I will happily take those questions uh, via email and uh, disseminate, disseminate them to our, our specialist speakers. So what I will do um, momentarily is pop my email address in the chat function on the conference platform. And um, I'm happy to take questions relating to specialist content uh, through that method. So I will mute myself now and we'll get started on the presentations. Thank you. Hello there, my name is Mary Claire Kennedy. I'm here today to lead on the Arch Institute of Pharmacy's panel discussion, which is entitled Supporting and Facilitating Professional Development for Pharmacists During the COVID-19 Pandemic. The IAP are delighted that we've been asked to contribute to the RCSI Charter Meeting of 2022. By means of introduction, as I mentioned, my name is Mary, Mary Claire Kennedy and I'm a peer support pharmacist with the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. I'm also a senior lecturer in pharmacy practice at the University of Leeds. We have a few other contributors to our panel discussion today. They include Professor Abby Lane, who's a consultant psychiatrist and professor at the School of Medicine, University College Dublin. Muriel Pate, who is a medication safety specialist pharmacist with the HSE, and Marie Philbin, a chief one antimicrobial pharmacist with the HSE. So I will lead on this discussion and we will have included some pre-recorded clips from these individuals today as well as part of the presentation. At the outset, allow me to introduce um, what we're going to um, review today. I would like to discuss the work of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy and how they supported and facilitated professional development during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the ongoing work that, they, that has taken place from the start of the pandemic 2020 through to the present day. How the Irish Institute of Pharmacy identified and then met the learning and practice needs of pharmacists who are registered in the Republic of Ireland. The range of learning and development needs that pharmacists have extend from non-clinical type of activities, professional type activities, through to um, therapeutic and clinical learning needs. And this is reflected within the content of our presentation today. So I will include um, an excerpt from Professor Abby Lane, uh, where she outlines um, some useful information for pharmacists on flattening the stress curve that they encounter during their professional practice. And also a recently delivered Paxlovid presentation, so a newly licensed medication for COVID-19 in the Republic of Ireland. So I hope for you um, today that you will gain an understanding of the important work that the Irish Institute of Pharmacy do to support pharmacy professionals in Ireland, as well as gaining some understanding that will hopefully be of, of use to your professional work. So for those who might be unfamiliar with the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, or IOP for short, was established by the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland. And their role is in relation to the development and management of continuing professional development for pharmacists in the Republic of Ireland. So in essence, what this means is that they um, facilitate um, pharmacists completing CPD, and they also review this CPD on a periodic basis. Part of their activities there for including quality assurance of education and training programmes and advertising and offering these to pharmacists. Overall, the vision of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy is the promotion of excellence within the pharmacy profession in Ireland. So thereby enhancing patient care, improving professional standards and enhancing education and research within the area of pharmacy practice in Ireland. So they hold a very important role, therefore, for all registered pharmacists in terms of their ongoing training and development. And therefore, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy played a very important role in meeting and addressing the learning needs of pharmacists during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
I'm sure we can all think back to the point where we had new clinical guidance coming online every day, changing public health guidance, the introduction of vaccines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was an enormous amount of change that took place for all healthcare professionals over the past few years. In addition, we had patients and the general public asking questions of us as well. And so we were there to support and inform the general public also. So it was really instrument or pivotal that pharmacists were up to date on all the necessary information um, so that they could both practice effectively and safely, but also uh, meet the needs of their, their popu the population base and their, their patients. So in order to address the learning needs of pharmacists in relation to particularly COVID, the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland requested that the Irish Institute of Pharmacy establish a, a, a repository where high quality contemporaneous resources and information could be placed so that pharmacists could easily access them and that these resources would be kept up to date throughout the, um, the pandemic period. So in response to this, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy developed uh, an, an element to their website called the COVID Hub, and this contained many, many different resources. Some of them were um, resources from um, external bodies and external agencies. Um, they were newly developed training programs or perhaps re-advertisements of training programs that were relevant or even more relevant during the pandemic period. Um, and also providing a library of peer reviewed articles and publications. So essentially what this was, was a one stop shop for pharmacists to engage with um, relevant and current information um, for the for relating to the pandemic and that they would therefore not having to be uh, keeping track of information themselves and seeking out information themselves, that this was a trustworthy and up to date resource. So with a view to developing the COVID hub, a COVID hub working group was established. And this um, was made up of individuals from the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, members from community pharmacy and, and hospital pharmacy, so patient facing pharmacy groups. There were also subject matter experts that fed into the COVID hub working group also. And the Irish Institute of Pharmacy took a lead on maintaining the resource and ensuring that was, it was contemporaneous and accurate. So on the screen, you can see the various domains of the COVID hub and the various different um, elements of the, the, the uh, COVID hub. It ranges from quite clinical um, elements, such as emergency medicines and vaccination services, through to um, perhaps more professional practice issues relating to mental health and well-being or returning to practice. So when individuals who perhaps have been off the register for a period of time sought to rejoin the register in response to uh, workforce needs during the, the pandemic period. So you might wonder um, what was the extent of engagement with this particular resource and how were pharmacists using the resource. So you can see here is an excerpt of traffic to the website over a, approximately a, a year long period, a year and a few months. And you can see um, during periods of um, perhaps scaling down of um, restrictions, there was less traffic to the website or during periods when there was an uptick on cases or whether when there was something new happening or something new being introduced, there was an increase in traffic to the website. So, for example, a change to um, how pharmacists were contribute, contributing to the vaccination campaign, there suddenly was increased traffic. And this is quite reassuring in that obviously pharmacists felt that this particular aspect of the IOP website was trustworthy, up to date and useful in order to support their development needs. Breaking this down a little bit further, we can see this come, uh, come out a little bit more in the data in that you can see the red line, um, the information on the COVID hub relating to vaccination services, the traffic went up considerably over a few months there. And this is very much in response to um, the emerging role of pharmacists in relation to the, co the COVID vaccination campaign. Another really 
part of the COVID hub was this element of mental health and well-being. And well, mental health and well-being has various different um, perspectives. We can think about the perspective of pharmacists um, who were undergoing um, or experiencing enormous stress within their work during the COVID period. They perhaps were experiencing more professional isolation than, than before and perhaps a changed workload or an increased workload. They also had colleagues out sick and, and so there was pressure, um, different pressure perhaps in patient facing roles than there had been years gone by. Also, the patient groups with which they were interacting were also experiencing their own mental health um, and well-being concerns. We all know about patients um, who were experiencing social isolation or um, for if, uh, or who were experiencing um, isolation due to having to stay in because of, of um, health issues. So there was a real and urgent need to address both the uh, mental health and well-being uh, concerns of the um, pharmacy population, but also the patient groups with which they're interacting. And so the mental health working subgroup was established as part of the overall COVID hub working group. And these individuals undertook a number of activities. There was a re-advertisement of some training programs that already existed. So for example, the lithium um, training program, and there was the development and offering of other activities to pharmacists. So for example, the conflict management training workshop for pharmacists. The webinar series is also quite responsive to the mental health and wellbeing agenda in that webinars specifically relating to mental health and wellbeing were advertised. And these included topics such as developing resilience, flattening our stress curve, managing communications challenges and strengthening our connections. These topics came about from cited from the profession about what they perceived to be their particular professional needs and then seeking out speakers who were experts within their subject area to speak on these matters. I'll now share with you an excerpt from Professor Abby Lane, who spoke about the topic of flattening our stress curve. And in doing so, what I hope that you will gain from it is an understanding of the type of information that is being made available to pharmacists on this topic, and also that you, as a viewer, will gain some tips in identifying um, what contributes to stress, how you experience stress, and some um, ways in which you can address stress. So allow me to pull this up now. It's going to take one moment. Just bear with me. Now, the core piece of stress and its impact on our performance is this curve. And you may be already familiar with it. It's called the stress performance curve. And Essentially, what it means is that as our performance increases, our, as our stress level increases, our performance increases. So we all need some stress to get going. Otherwise, we'll be too laid back. The idea is that we try to get into that yellow zone of optimum stress and that we try not to become so stressed that we move into the orange and red zones fatigue, exhaustion, anxiety and burnout become increasingly possible. And this is where that the amount of pressure or stress we come under starts to impact on our performance and prevent us from working to the best of our ability. Now, you sent in some scores in terms of your stress levels and I've graphed those uh, based on the responses that we had up to yesterday. So these are your responses um, when asked the question to rate your stress levels between one lowest and 10 highest. And the 230 of you sent these back. Now essentially you can see when you compare it with the previous curve that your responses are shifted to the right. So they're moved more in medium or moderate to high levels. And overall, 85% of you scored in the medium to high level, so that's quite high. It's hard to get a comparator because there's not much um, available in terms of stress and the impact in the pandemic. But I can tell you that all the final year medical students 
65% of them would fall, fall into the medium to high category, and that was using this same scale. But data from Blonnet Hayes' study of consultant and non-consultant hospital doctors in the country, 80% um, reported that they were stressed, but not they didn't give an actual particular rating as to whether it was medium or high. So it does appear that you are certainly, as you indicated in your responses, feeling the effects of, of stress and moving out of that optimum zone into the orange and the red. So we need to do, I suppose, a little bit of work on this and to look at how we can help flatten this and shift this curve back. So stress results, it's, it's a survival or a threat response. So when we feel a threat, we mount a, a survival response. It's immediate and it's in response to, I suppose, trauma, conflict or demands. So it gets us on our toes, gets the job done, gets us ready for um, what's ahead of us. But it can be real or perceived and the current climate because of the level of fear that surrounds, the level of contamination and risk, the worries about health and of ourselves and others, the fear of making mistakes, the changes that we're experiencing in such quick succession, concern maybe about finances and about the future for us personally and as a society. So all of these act as really um, strong threats at the moment that are driving our stress response. It's not helped by the uncertainty and it's certainly not helped by the information overload that's occurring at the moment and very much by the, the words that are, we are being exposed to. You know, the words like catastrophic that automatically creates that sense of fear. And as our own Dr. Mike Ryan of the WHO said, we need a vaccination, a vaccine against misinformation as well as against the virus. But what happens when we're under threat is that a part of our brain called the amygdala, which is the threat or fear center, gets activated. Now this is an immediate response. It overrides all other types of thinking or controls that we have because it needs to activate our fight, flight or freeze response. So it needs to get us ready to, um, make, to react if we are in of any type. And in prehistoric life, this was, you know, getting up your cudgel to fight or getting ready to flee very quickly. In modern life, it comes across as other behaviours. And I think a number of you have mentioned this in your feedback. So in, in modern life, our stress or fight response makes us irritable. It makes us, can make us hostile, can make us suspicious. If we have a flight response, we can be avoidant. We may not want to go to work. We may not want to get involved in tasks. Um, we may not want to go outside the home. We become hesitant, indecisive. And at its most extreme, we can freeze. And this means that we actually become unable to perform and become detached or withdrawn. And of course, that detachment and withdrawal links very much to empathy. So when we're very stressed under fight or flight, we can lose our concern for others and can appear maybe to have a more or less um, empathic approach in, in the workplace. So this is what happens when we are threatened or feel stressed. I'm going to spend a few moments on this, starting at the top, when we see that a threat is perceived, a distress signal is sent to our hippocampus. Now, the importance of that is that that communicates with our body and floods us with adrenaline. And adrenaline is what gives us, as was that on edge, tense feeling. It's the high heart rate, the tightened muscles, the breathing difficulties. Our senses are sharpened, so you may become more sensitive to noise or to interference, and it releases blood sugar and fastens the bloodstream, so we may have difficulty controlling our energy levels, our appetite may change, or we may put on weight. But the piece that's 
I suppose most relevant from a psychiatric point of view and a mental health point of view is the stress hormone cortisol because that's released when we come under prolonged stress and that tends to modify or shut down body functions so that affects our immune system our reproduction system and our digestive system so we become more prone to infection we become more prone to picking things up and being less able to fight them off we can our periods may stop our menstruation may be affected and our dig digestive system can get quite sluggish um, and heavy but that then once the threat passes the cortisol levels drop and the stress response ends except of course in this situation there isn't an end in sight at the moment and we are, remain under prolonged stress. So what's happening is that our cortisol is responding to the chronic stress and it's affecting our sleep. So our sleep is inadequate or poor quality, our nutrition, our digestion is affected and we experience emotional distress. And there's a direct link between cortisol and anxiety and mood disorders. But I suppose from a functioning point of view, and I know particularly that, that you know, pharmacists are very much in an attention to detail, um, risky profession where, you know, the, the, I suppose, impact of any mistakes that are made are, could be quite significant. Um, and I know that it's busy at the moment and there are long hours and lots of demands. And this is where I think the impact of cortisol is really significant because in that bottom box on the left you'll see that it affects our attention, our ability to focus, our perception, our ability to pick things up, our short-term memory, our working functional memory, so we become forgetful or distractible and it affects our learning and sometimes our word finding and finding and our cognitive function. So the, the I suppose what you've described in your feedback would be both the combination of the adrenaline and the cortisol effects um, in terms of what's happening for you. And there's a very, very clear and emerging link between stress and illness and physical act of the body. So it really affects every organ of the body. And it's also linked to many cancers and to aging. So it's a very significant um, normal body reaction, but something that when it gets to the high levels needs to be managed um, to, in order to prevent these um, negative, I suppose mainly long-term consequences, but the other uncomfortable and distressing immediate effects of, of um, a prolonged which would be regarded as prolonged now given that it's been going on for the last um, eight to ten weeks. So tonight we're going, I know many of you wanted to look at how stress affects the body, but we're going to move on now to look at how um, we might look at managing all of this and coping or dealing with what is going on in, in our lives. So the important piece about stress management, and there is lots of information out there, but the important piece is that 80% of stress-related illness is manageable. I know it can be hard in the current environment to even imagine that that's the case, um, but in my experience, you know, it was even before COVID arrived in the busy environment we were in, it was sometimes hard to look at focusing on, on stress management. And I suppose what I would be saying to you, I know it's difficult, but we need to, as the um, airline attendants say, we need to put on our own oxygen mask first. So in order for us to manage and be effective and to prevent difficulties for ourselves and those around us, we really need to look at taking control of the things we can in this very uncertain environment. And at the end of the day, the things that we can control are our thoughts, 
our reactions and uh, our habits. And I suppose it, it isn't easy starting out on a stress management process. Um, for this reason, I've put in some short, quick activities that you can do and have immediate effect, um, as well as looking at the, the long term. But the piece of stress management is making that decision, um, hard and all as it might be. And it's trying to move from, I suppose, the position where one feels I can't because of lots of different reasons to feeling that I can. And I suppose that's the choice we need to make because um, busy people aren't necessarily productive or content or happy people. And certainly stressed people's quality of life can be affected by the activities that they engage in. Bear with me a moment again while I um, get back to the screen. So that was a clip from Professor Abby Lane uh, giving an example of some of the information that has been given to pharmacists in relation to managing their their own stress within their professional practice and I hope you gained something from it as well. Another element of the mental health and well-being aspect um, that's addressed by the Irish Institute of Pharmacy is a recently developed podcast series called The Resilient Pharm Pharmacist and this is a 10 episode podcast series uh, facilitated by Dr Katrina Bradley. And during the 10 episodes, Katrina met with a range of individuals, mainly pharmacists, and discussed uh, a number of mental health issues such as anxiety, stress, burnout, personal illness and bereavement, moving right through to navigating work and stress relating to management situations, for example. So this podcast is really a departure perhaps from some of the more traditional methods by which the Irish Institute of Pharmacy sought to engage with the profession, in that the podcast is published available on the usual podcast platforms. Members of the public can access this as well. And in terms of the listenership, it is quite popular. There have been, there have been over 4,000 listens um, to the podcast so far, and that's about an average of 250 per episode. If you consider this in context of the size of the professional register, which is about 6,000 pharmacists, a listenership of 4,000 um, is, is quite good in relation to this. Although we totally acknowledge that members public are, are most likely listening to this podcast series as well if they are interested. The In Conversation with Webinar series is another element of um, or another innovation that was introduced by the Irish Institute of Pharmacy that in a way to, to address the learning and development um, needs that pharmacists had. Of course, the Irish Institute of Pharmacy always had a presence in terms of face-to-face -face or online training and education, but the COVID-19 pandemic really, like every other method of teaching and education provision, moved everything online. And this is a highly popular um, series. It takes place every other Wednesday evening and um, engages um, uh, experts on a range of issues from uh, very clinical issues, so for example, um, therapeutic management of solid organ transplants through to uh, the other end spectrum professional practice issues. And so, for example, the mental health and well-being um, series of webinars was part of this webinar series that flattening our stress curve was part of the uh, in conversation with webinar series. And again, you can see the numbers here in relation to engagement, and they've remained broadly constant from 2020 through to the current day. And again, this is um, considerable when you consider the overall register of pharmacists in the country. They are available, the recordings of these webinars are available on the Irish Institute of Pharmacy website and are, are widely engaged with by the profession. We've had about 6,000 rewatches of the available webinars so far. What I'm going to move to now is the presentation on Paxlovid from Mary Philbin and um, Uriel Pate. 
And this is um, a very newly licensed medicine for the management of COVID-19 in certain populations. And I hope you'll find the information that's shared with, during this presentation useful for your own practice. So just bear with me again for a moment while I get this up and running. Just take a little while. Thank you, Mary Claire. Um, good evening, everybody, and um, you're very welcome to this session. And I'm sure you're all very interested to um, to hear about this drug, um, considering uh, that it's that it's in the country now, and um, I guess um, the administrative pieces are being worked through. So, as Mary Claire said uh, in the introduction, myself and Muriel are going to focus on the clinical aspects um, of the drug. We will define um, the place in therapy currently in accordance with the HSE interim guidance. Uh, we will um, include information on the dosing adm and administration aspects, um, following on with the safety considerations and obviously, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, the, the drug interactions piece with this medication. And we will wrap it up then by going through six case studies um, to, I suppose, clarify really the place, place in therapy, highlight um, examples that will be applicable to your day-to-day -day practice um, and the management of potential um, drug interactions. So in terms of its place in therapy, it's indicated for the treatment of COVID-19 in adults who do not require supplemental oxygen and who are at increased risk of progressing to severe COVID. So this infographic is taken from the HSE interim guidance for the pharmacological management of patients with COVID-19 and that's the version 4.1 of the guidance which is available online currently. And you can see uh, here, I think my arrow is hovering over it, that the Paxlovid very much has a role in the community setting and um, potentially in some hospitalised patients where they don't have that oxygen requirement. And as I said, that's, that infographic is taken from um, the interim guidance if you want to look at it in more detail. The mechanism of action of Paxlovid, so um, Paxlovid is a combination of two drugs, uh, Nermotrelvir and Ritonavir. Um, Nermotrelvir is the active component and that is a protease inhibitor and then Ritonavir's function is to um, increase the plasma levels um, of Nermotrelvir for its activity. Uh, so we've included the link to the SPC here and just, just to say that the European uh, Medicines Agency has given condition, has authorised um, this medication on it under a conditional approval scheme. So that means that there is further evidence um, on this medicinal product awaited. So again, the status of um, that may change. And Mary, I think it's just helpful to say in terms of the conditional approval, um, you know, it just highlights or just makes it more important than ever to be thinking about the fact that, you know, maybe hasn't had the full rigour of some other medicines in terms of its uh, coming to market now. So the HPRA um, link to report any adverse reactions is particularly important for, for it as such a new drug. Thanks, Muriel. Absolutely. And um, that's a really important point to add at this point. Um, and, and following on nicely to that is um, just highlighting the, the single study that has resulted in this conditional approval. It's the EPIC HR study. Uh, so there were 2,000 2, odd patients included in this, uh, approximately 1,000 in the Paxlovid arm and then 1,000 in the placebo. Um, and it showed that there was a reduction in the hospitalization or death from any cause in the Paxlovid group in comparison to the placebo. Again, but I think it's very important to state that this, you know, the, these are relatively um, relatively low numbers um, that, that, that we're dealing with. And moving on then to the HSE interim guidance, to, so to share with you um, where Paxlovid has been indicated. Again, this medication, there will be a limited, limited supply, so it very much needs to be prioritised to those patients that are going to get the most um, benefit from this medication. The epic HR study was uh, carried out in an unvaccinated population, so that's where the, 
the greatest benefit um, in terms of the data that we know at this point. Um, so obviously that is included in the interim guidance. So it's that unvaccinated adult patient at risk of progression to severe COVID um, not requiring supplemental oxygen. And it's there, those patients are defined as tier one and tier two, and we'll, we'll cover that um, uh, in a later slide. And then also for those patients that may not have had an adequate um, response to their immunization um, or in terms if they experience the disease that they, they may not have that um, adequate immune response. So it's a five day course um, recommended to be started within five days of symptom onset with a confirmed diagnosis of COVID by PCR or another high specificity um, method approved by a hospital laboratory director. So at this point, it's it's timely to define what, what is a vaccinated or an unvaccinated patient. So for the purposes of the guidance, the unvaccinated patient is defined as those who've received their COVID who have not um, commenced or their vaccination schedule is incomplete. In terms Mary, of yeah, sorry. Yes, Mary. Yeah, great. Come on. Yeah, no, I suppose it's just important here to note that this might be a different definition from some other definitions of what it means to be fully vaccinated. So, you know, it's, it's the primary course, which is the most important one that we're they're really talking about here. Thanks, Muriel, for clarifying that. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so it's it's regardless of whether they've had their 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 booster dose at not or not. And again, I think Muriel, you agree. It's it's important at this point to to clarify or or suppose to, to to raise the point that really the vaccines are the superior are superior to the current treatments that we have available. Um, so they very much should not be seen um, as alternatives to vaccination. <laughs> And again, look, we'll 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 see how the evidence base develops, but um, that's 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 the position um, currently. So again, as I said, um, detailing those eligible patient groups a little bit further. So your tier one patients are those immunocompromised adult patients not expected to mount an adequate immune response to vaccination or to the infection due to their underlying conditions. Um, regardless of, of their vaccination status <laughs> and those immunosuppressed adult patients who've had rituximab in the last 12 months or other B cell or T cell depleting therapies or high dose steroids. Um, and those high dose steroids are defined as uh, patients receiving over 40 milligrams of prednisolone or the equivalent a day for more than a week or more than 20 milligrams a day for two weeks in the last three months. The tier one unvaccinated patients are those all adults over 75 that are unvaccinated or those unvaccinated that are over the age of 55 years with additional risk factors. And again, those additional risk factors are detailed in the guidance, but an example are those with hypertension or obesity with a BMI greater than 35. And your tier two patients are those unvaccinated adult patients at risk of se severe disease not included in tier one and they're any adult over the age of 65 or adults under the age of 55 with additional risk factors. Again, I suppose there's a lot of information to take in in that slide, but to say that it is all in the interim guidance and that the, the link is, is available there for your information. Yeah, and I think it's probably helpful just for people or maybe a little bit reassuring that, you know, we're, there's no expectation that community pharmacies are going to be policing who's eligible and not eligible. You know, it's certainly possible that, you know, you may uh, get queries from patients and, and maybe um, raising awareness about these medications with your patients, but it's not that you're going to have to, you know, work your way down through the, cri the eligibility criteria for every script that comes your way. Um, that's not an expectation. Yeah, Muriel, and um, yeah, it's important to to have the awareness of that if 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 patients ask you if if you think they would be um, an eligible patient for this medication. Yeah. In terms of the dosing information, so you'll see the 
image there is um, what the what the individual um, daily blisters look like. So you've got your um, morning dose, morning dose, three tablets for the morning dose and three tablets for the evening dose. And that's split up into two Nerma Trelvir, um, which on the blister is referred to as PF 0732132. Um, so two of those tablets and one ritonavir, uh, 100 milligrams. So the dosing information is that there's three tablets taken together in the morning and in the evening. And again, ideally spaced, um, spaced 12 hours apart. And that's a five day treatment course. So um, there is a requirement to reduce the dose if the patient has renal impairment and that's for those with a GFR of between 30 and 60. If it's le if they have an, a GFR less than 30, then it's contraindicated. And the dose reduction is a reduction from two Nermatrelvir to one twice a day. So there will be a requirement and there's no change to the ritonavir dosing. Um, so there will be a requirement at the dispensing point to remove one Nermatrelvir tablet from the morning dose and one Nermatrelvir tablet from the evening dose in all, in all of the daily blister packs. Okay, so you'll be removing um, 10 tablets. Okay. And then in terms of timing of administration or um, other aspects to consider, it can be taken with or without food. It needs to be swallowed whole and not chewed, broken or crushed. So it's very important to call out at this point that if you have a patient with difficulty swallowing or an enteral feeding tube, um, as, and they would get their, their no normal medication via that route, then these patients are not a candidate for this medication at this point in time. Um, if if a patient misses a dose within eight hours, then it's fine to take it um, as soon as soon as they remember within that eight hours. But if the the missed dose is longer than eight hours, then the patient shouldn't take the dose and just wait until the next dose. In terms of adverse effects, um, these are the most common that are reported in the SNPC. So at um, a, dif a difference in taste, so it can be a change in taste that things are there are all possibly tasting metallic. Um, is one example: diarrhea in three percent of cases and headache in uh, just over one percent of the patients. So, Muriel, I'm going to hand over to you now as we come on to the safety considerations and drug interactions. Great, thanks, Maine. Um, so yeah, we might move on to the next slide. Um, so I suppose you know you're all on here to to hear about Paxlovid. So I'm sure most of you are, are aware that there are a significant number of drug interactions with this particular drug, and that's mainly due to the ritonavir component. Um, so we know um, that ritonavir was previously or still is used um, as part of HIV therapy. So there is quite a lot of information which has been kind of built on to inform us in terms of what the drug interaction profile will be. And um, obviously we have, I suppose, the key information sources that, that are going to be most useful to you. Obviously there's the SBC and the link is there for that. Um, but there's another resource which um, we're going to run through um, here and in the case studies because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really useful resource which um, has evolved from um, work that the University of Liverpool have done with HIV meds over the years, but they've updated their uh, website to include COVID-19 um, drug interactions, and they have um, updated it with all the relevant interactions for Paxlovid, which is um, really helpful to people um, uh, who, who can access that freely. So um, the link for the Liverpool Drug Interaction Checker is on uh, the slide there, um, and you can enter a number of medicines for um, any individual patient on that. Um, and then also from the website, there is a PDF available, and that's the image which is shown on the right hand side there. And that's, I suppose, a quick reference guide. So it is something that might be useful to print out and have um, handy as a quick reference. Um, there's a lot more information on each of the drugs if you do go into the website and, and check the details uh, for each drug. 
and also Muriel just to let people know that it's available as an app as well which is which is very handy um to use on your um on your smartphone as well and to I suppose emphasize um the the usefulness of this interaction checker really provides um really on point practical information that that is what you require at the point of dispensing so it will recommend a particular drug if it's suggesting to hold it to hold it for um x number of days say in terms of a statin um it'll say to hold it for eight days or whatever so it really is a really practical resource yeah. so definitely um we would be advocating that you would you would consider it as your your routine check um, when you're when you're going through these medications. Yeah, I certainly found when looking at um, the information from the Liverpool checker that it's much more kind of um, this is what you need to do. Whereas the SPC, while obviously it's you know comprehensive and it's useful, um, it doesn't necessarily give you such specific guidance on the steps that you should take. And then the other thing actually, which I didn't mention there, was that Pfizer do have. Um, uh, a website checker available now, which um, has just recently been updated, updated for the EU. So um, I think there's a QR code on the packaging that people can also access that. Um, it's the same information that's in the SPC though. Okay, so in terms of drug interactions, um, so the main reason for the all the drug interactions is um, due to ritonavir, which is a CYP3A inhibitor. And then nematrovir is a substrate of CYP3A. So it's just really important to note that interactions um, with other drugs can lead to really clinically significant reactions, and they do include potentially life-threatening or fatal reactions. Um, they can also include a loss of therapeutic effect of Paxlovid, and there's a possibility of development of viral resistance to Paxlovid as well. Um, and so it is it's really, really important to carefully check all concomitant uh, meds before and during treatment. So to be, I suppose, alert to the possibility of adverse drug reactions associated with any other uh, concomitant medicine. Um, and just, I suppose, to bear in mind as well that Paxlovid shouldn't necessarily be started immediately after stopping certain contraindicated medicines, um, particularly those with a very long half-life. So that's just something to kind of bear in mind as well. And then one very important interaction just to be particularly alert to is that it may reduce the efficacy of combined oral contraception um, oral contraception. So anyone who uses combined oral contraception should be advised to use an alternative method or additional barrier method while they're being treated with um, Paxlovid and then also for a full menstrual cycle after stopping treatment. So just in terms of the steps that need to be taken, um, obviously with the drug with um, such, I suppose, uh, the importance of the drug interactions with this drug, there is a real need for a careful medication history check. So obviously you not need to, to know what all the currently prescribed medicines that the patient is taking and, and most of those will be available to you um, if the, pa the patient regularly comes to one particular pharmacy. But there is a real need to just really confirm with the patient whether they get any prescriptions from any other prescribers or whether they attend any other pharmacies. Um, and to check with them if they take any OTC or herbal medicines because some of those do have significant drug interactions um, with Paxlovid. And then just, I suppose, to check that they aren't getting medicines from any other locations. So, you know, some of the mental health services sometimes administer meds and um, any inpatient or outpatient um, hospital meds, including, say, intermittent IV treatments um, or that there are, you know, to check if there are any uh, clinical trials or early access schemes. And just also to bear in mind illicit drugs and particularly noting that, you know, there are interactions with sleeping tablets with um, uh, with Paxlovid. Um, so GPs and prescribers are being encouraged to liaise with community pharmacy at an early stage. So um, I suppose it, it remains to be seen, you know, exactly how things will work in practice. Um, but it, um, it's, I suppose it's envisaged that a lot of the time you will know about a, a prescription for Paxlovid before it comes, you know, in the door. Um, and then, so, so there's a delay in terms, there may be a delay in terms of waiting for a PCR result for the patient. 
Um, and then I suppose the other point is that um, the pharmacy can only order Paxlovid once the prescription has been received. So there's a couple of points in time where there will be a delay before um, the patient will be dispensed to Paxlovid. And in some ways that, that's quite useful because it just does allow you to have you know, a pause to make sure you have time and um, to assure yourself that the all the checks, you know, have been made that it is safe for Paxlovid to be dispensed for this particular person. Um, if GPs are are um, putting in a query to the NMIC, um, there's been a um, they're being asked to CC the nominated pharmacy on any of those requests so that that information um, would be available to the pharmacy as well. Um, and then the other piece is about renal function. So, you know, um, asking yourself if the patient is known to have renal impairment, that's not necessarily something that's always going to be known in a community pharmacy setting, unless the patient is on medicines for that, or they're able to tell you that they do have renal impairment. So again, it's not something that we necessarily would expect community pharmacies to go finding out what the patient's renal function is. Um, that's not an expectation. Um, but obviously, because of that um, possible reduction in the dose, if somebody has um, a degree of renal impairment, you do need to be familiar with what that means in practice in terms of um, advising the patient about the dose that needs to be taken and removing those additional tablets if they are on that re reduced renal dose. And Muriel, just to come in on that, there's, you know, um, it, it, it definitely is a point to highlight is that communication piece with the patient, um, because again, the patient isn't going to be coming to collect these medications, uh, this medication if, if they're obviously COVID positive. Um, so it's, it's making sure that that information is either directly communicated to the patient via phone um, or if if, if you're confident that the, the, the person collecting the medication will relay that because again it'll be could be quite confusing for patients opening their their box of medication and seeing um tablets missing from the blister yeah i think that applies you know even if they're on the standard dose it's not necessarily all that straightforward a, a medicine so um you know i think it will be um the one that that does need careful communication um most likely directly over the phone if, if that's um, an option that's available. Um, okay, so this is a, um, a flow chart which is included in the HSC guidance and it's also taken from the University of Liverpool website. So uh, on the left hand side, it just runs through the contraindications. So it's, um, it's not a drug that's licensed for paediatric use. Um, so, um, so adults only, and then um, it's not, uh, it's not recommended for use in pregnancy either. And then <clears throat> uh, severe renal impairment, severe liver disease or contraindications. And um, the patient does need to be able to swallow tablets. And then once those, once you've checked off those, it's um, it's a case of checking through any interactions um, for the patient. So I suppose that middle red box is just what we had on the previous slide about making sure that you're considering all medicines that the person may be taking um, from different sources. Um, so and Muriel, just to, to clarify on that local age restrictions, um, just to let people know that this is an internationally used reference source. Um, the, the states very much um, hold it in high regard, and it's it's referenced in a lot of their key um, key, key websites. And I think the US are potent are possibly using Paxlovid to down to lower age groups potentially. I think potentially twelve. Don't don't directly quote me on that but mm -hmm. but just to explain that that that's that's what that means um in terms of check local age restrictions so it's very much for that international usage um but for mm -hmm. here it's for those that are 18 and older yeah and and that might may change over time as more evidence comes through yeah. mm -hmm. um okay and then just moving down that middle section there to the to where the amber uh, boxes so i suppose it's a case of checking each of the other medicines of person is taking um, to make sure that there is uh, no interactions. They, if on the Liverpool checker, they'll come up as red, amber or green. So green is that there's no expected um, interactions. Amber is potential and red is uh, a significant uh, interaction. Um, but with all of them, including some of the red ones, it is worthwhile just 
reading, there's additional text um, for each of them. And it is really worthwhile reading that because sometimes there's very useful information which can um, which can allow for um, administration in certain cases. So a really good example of that was, is with the statins. So for example, um, um, I think simvastatin comes up as red, but if you read through the, the information, um, it's clear that it can be given, but you just have to hold the statin for the five days of the Paxlovid treatment plus a further three days, and that applies to all of the statins. Um, so that's, I suppose, worthwhile just taking the time to read that detail. Um, and sometimes there might just be sort of additional advice that needs to be given to the person. So, um, it, you know, it might be just about, you know, watching out for perhaps increased sedation or something like that, which can be managed as maybe a caution rather than a contraindication. But it's just advice that can be given to the patient that can allow this um, this treatment to to be used in those really high risk people because um, some of them really are um, very vulnerable. So if we can use it, it, it is uh, useful to be able to make use of that clinical um, expertise that's that's kind of captured in this um, this resource and um, for the benefit of those people. Um, and then just finally, once all of that's been done, it's just that consideration as to whether they, they're going to get the full treatment standard course or the reduced renal course. And that's just a kind of a reminder about the need to report um, any um, suspected adverse reactions through the HPRA website, particularly given that it's such a new drug um, and it's, there, there's not a lot of uh, evidence of its use in real life yet. So it's definitely were worthwhile um, reporting anything um, and pharmacists can do so. And then finally, just before we sort of move on to some of the case studies, um, just a little piece about planning ahead. So we know at the moment that not all patients who might be eligible might even know that they're eligible for these new treatments. Um, and there will be comms coming out from HSC about, you know, raising awareness. And there will also be, I suppose, information going out through, say, patient advocacy advocacy groups um, where they're you know uh, sharing information with their um, with people who use their services who may be in those vulnerable groups and um, but it's, it's I suppose a couple of things which are useful is you know if you do have somebody who is a regular um, person that comes to your pharmacy and you know that they're definitely in tier one or tier two it's helpful for them to know that if they do test positive for COVID I suppose the main message is to contact their GP or their prescriber in the hospital quickly so that they can benefit from the treatments if they're eligible within that five day window, because you don't want them presenting on day five or after day five when it might be too late to coordinate everything and get the prescription issued. So that raising awareness um, may be very useful. And if you are doing so, just asking people to make sure they have a list of all of their medicines um, handy that can be shared with a, a prescriber just to, I suppose, save time and to um, make sure that that prescribing can happen safely. And if people um, are looking for a way of promoting that, um, the My Medicines list is available on the safermeds.ie website. And there's plenty of hard copies available from the health promotion website if you want to order a batch. So I think we might move on to some case studies. Um, the first one is Miss A.M. She's 54 with rheumatoid arthritis and no other um, significant history. She currently is on methotrexate 10 milligrams once a week and she takes folic acid two days after that and she's on PRN ibuprofen as well. Um, she had a home antigen test which was positive yesterday and she just makes contact with the pharmacy because she's aware that there's some new treatments. She's seen some um, information in the press, but she's not really sure whether they're available yet or if she would be someone that would be eligible. So I suppose the first question is, is she somebody who would be eligible? And this is a table taken from the HSC guidance and, it, and it's the treatment based section. So there's quite a long list of I suppose conditions which would mean that you might be eligible for these treatments and it, it covers things like you know um, people who've recently finished chemotherapy or radiotherapy and so on and um, transplant patients and so on but this is the section which is dealing with treatment-based um, reasons wh why you may be eligible so these are the people who'd be severely immunocompromised um, and if you look down through that, the, the one in red at the top is highlighted in red because that's the most severe you know, impact on your immune system, um, which would be rituximab. Um, so 
if there is ever a, a situation where there's limited supply in the country um, and it has to be severely prioritised, then these would be the people who would get it. But that's not the case at the moment. So any of the people who are on this list would be eligible in tier one or tier two. Um, and if we look down through this, um, we can see that methotrex methotrexate on its own isn't mentioned here. It's mentioned if someone is on a second bottom line there, biologic plus azathioprine or a biologic plus methotrexate. Um, but methotrexate on its own doesn't kind of place you in tier one or tier two. So just, oh yeah, and this is another table which is in the HSC guidance and it just calls out the specific drugs a little bit more, um, a little bit more clearly. And you can see uh, the first two boxes are the same drugs that were on the previous slide, but um, the third box down there is, 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 is um, includes methotrexate under the heading, the following therapies do not ordinarily impair vaccine responses and patients do not automatically fall into tier one unless there's clinical or lab evidence of immunodeficiency or a poor antibody response. So methotrexate is listed there um, under that heading. So on its own, methotrexate isn't enough for someone to be uh, eligible for these treatments. Um, now, same person. So when you check her, her medication history, you realize actually she was just recently on a course of steroids. <clears throat> so she had a course of prednisolone 40 milligrams for 10 days, um, which was then gradually reduced and finished that course a couple of weeks ago. And she was also on azimeprazole while she was on the prednisolone. And um, so the question now is, does this change her risk? And I suppose if you were paying attention to the tables on the previous couple of pages, you would have noticed that um, prednisolone um, treatment does, it may place somebody in tier one or tier two. And that's, that is dose dependent. Um, and the cutoff point is 40 milligrams uh, a day for a week or more. So in this particular lady's case, She's having 10, she's had 10 days of 40 milligrams. So that would certainly place her into tier one um, by virtue of the prednisolone rather than the methotrexate. So just, I suppose, thinking through the, the pathway for her, um, we can check down through the left-hand um, red box there, and we can see that there aren't any um, contraindications that we're aware of for her. Um, so we're gonna move on and check through her drug interactions. Um, so um, this is the page of the Liverpool checker, and it's a little bit busy, but if you just, I suppose, look, um, halfway down on the left hand side, there's a box for you to enter the first drug, which is Paxlovid. So you can enter it there. And then into the middle there, you enter any other drugs that the person is on. So um, when you've entered one, you can um, go back and start again and enter another one and it'll save any that are um, listed below for the same patient. So here we've just entered the methotrexate so far. And we can see on the right hand side, there's a, a, green a green box halfway down, which says that there's, it's green and there's no interaction expected with the methotrexate. So the other box to note there, actually, sorry, Mary, if you just go back there, just above that green box, there's um, an option to switch to table view um, on the right hand side, halfway down. And that's just a really handy way. Um, if you've got four or five or more drugs to check, with Paxlovid, it allows them to be all presented together. And that's what I'm gonna show you on the next slide. So this is the table view. So we've added all of her medicines. So her isomeprazole, folic acid, ibuprofen, and methotrexate for this lady. And you can see on the right-hand side, there's four green um, diamonds. So for all of those four medicines, there's no interaction expected. So for her, um, we, uh, we, we don't have any information to suggest that she needs to have any renal impairment dose adjustment. So it would be a standard dose five day course, um, which is the two nermatrevir um, tablets with the one ritonavir together um, BD for five days. And her normal medicines that she usually takes can stay as they are, take them as normal. So Mary, I think, do you want to go through the next case? 
Thank you, Muriel. Um, so case two um, is Mrs. PB. She's 78 years old. She has no known medical history and no regular medication. And uh, she has recently arrived from Ukraine with limited English and she's unvaccinated for COVID. So I think Mrs. PB is a likely type of patient um, that will be encountered um, over the coming weeks and months. So Mrs. PB has um, had COVID symptoms for the last two days. She's antigen test positive today. She's been seen by GP and is awaiting a PCR and UNEs. So um, from what I would have briefly uh, referred to earlier in the interim guidance, um, I'll uh, show you now on the next slide that Mrs. PB is in fact a candidate um, for Paxlovid. So she's in tier one and she's an unvaccinated adult patient over the age of 75 years old. Okay, and as Muriel would have highlighted, uh, we'll just do a quick check um, that she's not um, fitting any of the contraindication um, criteria and, um, and she's not taking any regular medication. So I guess we're just waiting um, to see what, what her renal uh, function comes back as in terms of what, what dose she would be prescribed. So as I said, she's not taking any other medication prescribed or over the counter. And this was confirmed with a family member that was translated. Her PCR does come back um, as COVID detected and um, her UNEs demonstrate that she has a creatinine clearance of 45 mils per minute. So that does um, put her in the category for a reduced renal dose. So her reduced dose then, as we would have referred to earlier, is one tablet of the Nermatrelivir with one tablet of the Ritonavir twice daily and for five days. And again, just to emphasize the, that you would be removing one of the Nermatrelivir tablets um, from both the morning and evening blister of each strip. Muriel, um, I'll hand back over to you to take us through case three. Okay, so next up we have Mr. TJ, he's 84 and he's hypertension, hypercholesteremia. His usual medicines are aspirin 75 daily, bisoprolol 5 milligrams daily, ramipril 5 milligrams daily, and atorvastatin 20 milligrams daily. Um, he has had one dose of this COVID vaccine, uh, but he didn't feel too well afterwards and decided against returning to get his second dose. So I suppose if you refer back to um, one of the earlier slides, by that definition, he's not considered to be vaccinated um, because he hasn't completed his primary course of, of vaccination. Um, he has had COVID symptoms for the last three days, uh, seen by GP and awaiting PCR. His last renal function test three months ago was um, showed a GFR of 70. So I suppose the question is, would he be somebody who would be eligible for Paxlovid? Um, so we check down through the, uh, the contraindications. Uh, we know that he's over 18, he's not pregnant, he's uh, got good renal function to the best of our knowledge, um, and we don't know of any severe liver disease, he can take his tablets. Um, so we're going to move on to checking his drug interaction profile. And this is from again from the Liverpool checker. So the first one that we're entering here is a tarvastatin, and you can see um, so that's in the middle column there, and you can see on the right hand side it's coming up as amber, so that's a potential interaction. So on this uh, screen, you can click on um, beside the right hand side um, text which says a tarvastatin just below that orange box, and that will bring up additional detail. So we'll show you. And this is the table view. So sorry, sorry. So this is the table view. So we can see that his other medicines are fine. Um, it's just the atorvastatin that we have a concern about. So if you look into the um, additional detail on the Liverpool website, this is what you'll what what will come up. Um, and it tells you that co-administration has not been studied but that atorvastatin is metabolized by CYP3A4 and concentrations of atorvastatin are expected to increase. Um, and that co-administration is not recommended unless specifically required for patient management. But that given the short duration of Paxlovid, um, atorvastatin should be stopped 
and the pragmatic approach is to stop um, a turvastatin temporarily or any other statin. Um, and that's considered to be acceptable considering it will not negatively affect the therapeutic effect of the statin because it's such a short um, inter interval when it's being paused. Um, but that it can minimise the risk of adverse um, events relating to a drug interaction. So if you're going ahead uh, with using it, um, a tarvastatin can be restarted three days after the last dose of Paxlovid. So the recommended action for this particular um, patient is to hold a tarvastatin during the Paxlovid five-day treatment course and for three days after. So that's holding it for eight days in total. And this person would be eligible for the standard treatment course of uh, Paxlovid and continue with all his other medicines um, as, as normal with no other um, adjustments needed to them. Okay, I'll come in on case four then. So we have Mr. HF is 30, he's 32 years old. Um, he had a renal transplant nine months ago. And again, just for the purposes of highlighting the case, we have um, included some potential medications that Mr. HF is on. But again, um, it's most likely um, a patient of such would be on a on a certainly a longer list of medications but uh, so he's on tacrolimus um, mycophenolate cotrimoxazole lansoprazole and prednisolone uh, he's had his three doses of covid vaccine as his primary course and then one booster dose so he's had covid symptoms for the last 48 hours and he's antigen positive at home seen by the gp awaiting a pcr and his last renal function was 35 mils uh was a gfr of 35 mils per minute so is mr hf a candidate for paxlovid um he certainly is according to the hse interim guidance and I suppose from from two aspects um one that he's been a recipient of a solid organ transplant within the last year and also then with the medication he's on so the tacrolimus the mycophenolate and the steroids okay so we we checked through to see if there's any other contraindications so he's 32 um we know the recent renal function um he doesn't have severe liver disease, able to take his medication fine. Um, so we'll check through then to see if there are any of his medications that are contraindicated. So using the Liverpool interaction checker, we check, um, we list all the medications here, as you can see in the, in the middle column and straight away, um, the contraindicated medications will, will appear on the, on the top of, on, the top of the search results. So we can see that tacrolimus is, contraindi is um, contraindicated and Mr. HF would not be a candidate um, for Paxlovid because of the interaction with tacrolimus. And we'll, we'll, on the next slide, I'll, I'll go through a little bit about that. And again, just to say that this is very much consistent with um, what Patricia King would have presented in her recent session. Um, uh, detailing the um, medication, the COVID medications um, in transplant patients. So um, there's a high risk that tacrolimus would reach uh, toxic levels if co-administered with the Paxlovid. Um, so I think this is a very good um, point in the presentation to highlight again, we mentioned earlier that you know, the evidence base for this medication, it's currently just one trial. So it's not a very strong evidence base. And um, so it's very much important, very important to call that out. And really that safety is of our utmost concern. So we don't want to put a patient um, at any risk due to these um, intera um, potential interactions. So it would be safer that Mr. HF did not get um, Paxlovid in this in this instance. And um, there is the option to re um, for his specialist team to review him to see if he is a consideration for any alternative treatments um, that are available for COVID at this point in time. Again, bearing in mind that um, you know this this situation can can actually change quite quickly in terms of what um, available medications 
um, are. And again, I suppose the most important thing to do would be just to have a check back to the current version of the HSC interim guidance. As I said, it's version 4.1 um, that's currently available. But again, that, that can change um, and sometimes um, over the matter of a couple of days. So it's very important to be aware of the, the most up-to-date guidance. Mm -hmm. Um, and Muriel, over to you for case yeah. five. Thank you. Um, so uh, case five is Mr. GM. He's 54 and he's a shift worker and he also has uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, he gets rituximab IV infusion every six months um, in the hospital setting, um, having had a dose four months ago. Um, and he's also on methotrexate and folic acid. He also sometimes um, uses Zopidem PRN for um, insomnia. Um, his scripts received in the pharmacy from hospital consultant um, for a standard pack of Paxlovid, so the 300 milligram um, and 100 milligram taken together, um, BD for five days. And I suppose the question is, is it safe to proceed with dispensing for this man? So, uh, so I suppose we check down through the, the contraindications and we are not aware of any uh, from that list. Um, so moving on to check through his drug interactions. Um, it's a little bit uh, faint, so I hope you can make this out. So, um, so we have the Paxlovid entered um, on the top left-hand corner with all of his other medicines in the middle there. And you can see that there's an amber warning coming up for Zolpidem. Um, and I've just popped the table view onto the same page. So that's what's down below there. So the table view shows us that, yeah, folic acid and methotrexate are, are fine. They're in the green category, but Zolpidem is amber. So um, what does that mean for this man? Um, so in summary for Zolpidem, um, the recommendation is that it could potentially increase Zolpidem exposure. However, a dose adjustment may not be necessary based on interaction data with ketoconazole. Um, but it, certainly patients should be informed that they may experience enhanced sed uh, sedative effects um, and that after stopping Paxlovid, the effect should disappear within three days. And um, on checking the SPC, it's, it's kind of similar information that's in the SPC, which says that Zolpidem and uh, Ritonavir may be co-administered co with careful monitoring for excessive sedative effects. So I suppose it's a caution rather than a contraindication. So I suppose in terms of advice to this particular man, um, you know, ideally, if you could avoid the Zolpidem while he's on the Paxlovid, if he currently just takes the PRN, that would probably be the best option. But if he is con continuing it, he just needs to be advised that he might find that Zolpidem will cause additional sedation while he's on the Paxlovid um, and for a couple of days after, and just to be cautious about any activities uh, the next morning. And I suppose it's, it's, it's worthwhile just pointing out that um, Zolpidem is cautioned, but there's some other benzodiazepines and um, sedatives which are actually contraindicated. So, um, you know, we haven't gone through all of the meds which are contraindicated in this presentation, but I think this is one that's worth just, you know, uh, drawing your attention to. So diazepam, fluorazepam and trazolam um, are all contraindicated with Paxlovid and then alprazolam would be cautioned um, similarly to Zolpidem. So that's our final case. Okay, so we've missed BT, uh, 62 years old with a past medical history of atrial fibrillation. And she also had <coughs> breast cancer where with completing her chemotherapy two months ago. So her current medication is tamoxifen, amiodarone, apixaban, atorvastatin, and perindopril. So Ms. BT is antigen positive at home and has heard about the new COVID treatment and phones your pharmacy asking whether she would be able to take it with her other medications. So in terms of eligibility, um, she certainly fits the criteria of being a candidate for Paxlovid. So she has an active solid cancer and she's completed her chemotherapy within three months. So again, um, just emphasizing the importance of the checks for each patient. So just checking that um, she doesn't have any of the contraindications, um, which she doesn't, but obviously just, just to check for the um, medication interactions. So using the drug interaction checker, 
Um, immediately we can see that um, there are two contraindications. So the first one being amiodarone and the second apixaban. And again, um, the patient has atrial fibrillation. So with amiodarone, it's not an option to, to stop or to hold that medication. And again, with apixaban, um, that is uh, not, not an option either. So in terms of the, the specifics of the interaction, so with amiodarone, there's um, certainly an increased um, possibility of the increased contraindications, which may ultimately lead to an increased um, risk of arrhythmias. And in terms of the pack, the apixaban, again, there's an increased concentration, obviously, with a subsequent increased risk of uh, bleeding. Okay, so that takes us to um, our summary slides, really. And I suppose we've we've highlighted these these key points um, th throughout the presentation. And Muriel, feel free to um, pop in as well if you want to add um, anything further to this. But just to emphasize that really um, vaccines are our first line of defense in terms of managing um, and preventing COVID infection. And they're superior to the treatments that are currently available for COVID-19. The evidence base for these novel agents um, these trials, again, were carried out in vaccinated, popu unvaccinated populations and prior to the emergence of the, the current circulating strains. So I think, you know, that's that's very important to, to bear in mind. And because of um, the lack of this strong evidence, it is very much a reasonable approach that clinicians may wish not to prescribe these um, therapies. Um, so, so just that that you're aware, and this is called out within the HSE interim guidance that this is a valid clinical management strategy. And um, due to the high prevalence of the interactions, again, it's very important to emphasise um, how critical it is to take that full drug history um, and to to make sure that all sources have been considered. Um, again, if the patient is potentially using other community pharmacies, um, or if they're accessing meds um, via via the hospital route and mm -hmm. their herbal and OTC medic. So I hope you enjoyed um, the overview I've provided on the work that the Irish Institute of Pharmacy has done to support pharmacists in recent years um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and also the excerpts from our contributors today on flattening the stress curve and the newly licensed medication Paxlovid. I hope that you've gained an understanding as to how the Irish Institute of Pharmacy is responsive to the professional and learning needs of pharmacists and that how they are responsive um, and how they address those needs range from supports that are online and a variety of online methods. So, for example, podcasts and ongoing webinars and the topics that are addressed uh, within um, these various um, initiatives are range from quite clinical therapeutic topics through to professional and personal supports and so we think about the mental health and well-being initiatives that have been um, led uh, by the IOP by the the supports on their their website and through the podcast series as well it's really important that the pharmacists um, who were providing care, patient-facing care during the pandemic had ready access to evidence-based guidance. And this was presented in an accessible, user-friendly format. These individuals were already un under considerable pressure uh, during the pandemic. And um, obviously the needed to be able to access information in the easiest possible format um, and in a way that they would choose. And therefore the different approaches the IOP adopted to address these needs has, been, has proved to be quite successful. There is also an ongoing need to collaborate with the profession to understand what their learning needs are and to address those and address those using various different methods, depending on what is in demand from the profession overall. So by means of conclusion, I would like to thank the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, the Executive Director, Dr. Katrina Bradley, and all the staff who work so hard at um, developing um, educational uh, programs and um, also 
uh, overseeing the various initiatives that have already been rolled out by the Irish Institute of Pharmacy. Um, the COVID Hub Working Group and the Mental Health Working Group, who were so instrumental in developing the COVID Hub and the ongoing maintenance of the Hub as well. The contributors to the Resilient Pharmacist podcast and all those who've contributed to the In Conversation with webinar series. And this webinar series continues to this day. If you're interested in understanding more about the work of the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, please do um, have a look at their website. And they're also on Twitter and on LinkedIn and on Instagram as well. And they have regular updates on their activities on these different social platforms. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this presentation today. Thank you to conclude and thank you for taking the time to listen to this recording. I hope that you found it helpful and insightful and that you will be able to take some learning points forward for your own particular working context. Thank you.